Well, good morning. We want to welcome you here to Reston Bible Church. We are in part three of a four-part series in Jonah. Today we are in chapter three. If you have a Bible you want to turn there, that'd be great. Uh, one reminder, just want to let you know that, uh, well, most of you should know by that now that Mike Myers and his family have responded to a uh, leading of God to move to a church in Florida. There's a lot of opportunity that, that God has called them to down there. Today is actually Mike's last Sunday, so if you run into him in the hallway, please feel free to, I want to really encourage you to greet him and uh, send them on their way and encourage them as they go. Well, we are in a series in Jonah, as I said. The title of our series is God's Relentless Mercy for All People. God's Relentless Mercy for All People. The verse it kind of overarches, the, over, overarches this entire series is Psalm 103, verse 8, which says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And we're going to see this verse pop up again in Jonah chapter 4, uh, verse 2. To us today, the call from this series is, do our hearts reflect his compassion for the world? When I think about moving out of here this afternoon, into my week, whatever that holds for me, do I take with me a heart that is right there with God's heart related to his compassion, bringing his relentless love and mercy to a world that so desperately needs it? If you're engaged with the engagement project, we hope that you are, and if you aren't in a shepherd group and aren't able to kind of access the engagement project through that means, we do have a group that meets on Sunday nights. Uh, here, Bob Schull is leading a group through that. I really want to encourage you to check that out. But one of the things you'll hear is a definition for agape love in that series, The Engagement Project. And it's the steadfast, sacrificial zeal that seeks the true good of another. God calls us to have a kind of love because of his mercy for all people that moves towards others with a sacrificial zeal, truly seeking their good. We have two weeks under our belt so far. The first week, by way of review, was about the rebellious missionary. Jonah received a call from God. Jonah responded, as we all do whenever we receive a call from God. His answer was no. And his goal was to get as far away from God's call as possible on his way to Tarshish. We see that our call, our response to God's call has consequences. Fortunately, in the plan of God, even Jonah, Jonah's negative response to God's call brought a response to the sailors that was actually, that brought them to the one true God. And we saw that God pursues people, his people who are running from him. And if you're, if God's calling you and you're get kind of frustrated and you're, you, you don't really want to respond well to that, we all do that at times. And you feel like God's kind of in hot pursuit of you, chances are good is that he is. That he's not going to let you go until you engage him. Last week we talked about the submissive, submissive missionary. How Jonah from the belly of, a, of the great fish sent up a prayer. And in that prayer he acknowledged the authority of God. He acknowledged his own, the relentless mercy that God has toward him. For you understand that being able to communicate God's relentless mercy to others is in part founded on our ongoing recognition of how much mercy he has for us. Jonah embraced God's discipline, his course correction and then ultimately he obeyed God which is where we are going to start today I've struggled with the title for today you know last week I talked about the pathetic missionary or you know kind of joking about that what I came up with for today is the barely obedient missionary <laughs> the barely obedient missionary we're going to read the entire chapter it's chapter 3 verses 1 through 10 then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying arise Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth. From the greatest of them to the least of them. The word reached the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. 
Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Father, thank you. Thank you for the book of Jonah, and we pray that as we walk through it, kind of unpack briefly the five critical steps in this chapter. Then, Father, as we consider, well, what does it mean for us today? How should we live differently because of this passage today? Lord, I pray that your spirit would be with us, that you would empower us. God, that we would be the people that you want us to be, the instruments that you have called us to be, to bring your relentless mercy to the people that you have sovereignly placed in our spheres of influence, we pray in your great name. Amen. Well, as I said, there are five parts to this message, to this chapter, excuse me. I'd like to put them all up on the screen all at once so you can kind of see where we're going. Then we're going to look at each one of them briefly and then again, kind of call us to, well, what difference does this mean to you and to me today? So there are five parts of this passage. God calls 2.0, right? This is God's second call on Jonah. Jonah obeys. He then goes and he preaches. Nineveh repents and then God relents. Now I will tell you, the first two we've kind of been covering over the last two weeks. We're going to focus at the end of our time together on that third one. The fourth and the fifth one, well, that's all God. We don't control anybody's repentance and God does what he's going to do. So ultimately when we land, we're going to land primarily on number three. But let's start at the beginning. God calls 2.0, chapter 3, verse 1. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I was talking with one of our staff members today, or uh, over the, this past week. And she said to me, she said, you're coming to one of my top 10 verses in the whole Bible. In Jonah chapter 3. And I said, I am? Uh, I'm thinking, well, which verse could it be? Well, maybe it's Jonah 3, 5. And the people of Nineveh believed God. I mean, that would be a miracle. I mean, here the, the people of Assyria, the Ninevites, they were awful pagan people. We've covered that. And they believe God. Well, surely that's a miracle. That's a great verse to perhaps be in your favorite. No, that's not it. I thought, well, I mean, honestly, no verse in Jonah 3 is on my top 10 list. So I'm, I'm like, which one is it? And she said, it's actually chapter 3, verse 1. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. And then she started saying, you know, the reality is that none of us deserve God's grace and mercy a single time. We don't deserve it the first time. But God's giving Jonah a second time. I, I mean, when you look at it, Jonah said no. He ran in the other direction. And if there was a time where God stripped someone's prophet status and said, prophet no more, it would have been right here. And since she was articulating how God gives all of us a second chance and a third chance. Has God placed a call in your life at some point and for a period of time you said no? And finally after God was chasing you down and chasing you down, maybe making your life challenging, you said yes. And you got a second chance. You know, I believe that for all of us, myself included, we could be just a little more grateful about the second chances that we've received all along the way. And if you're willing to do a little bit of history, history searching, you might see how often God gives us second chances. And the foundation that, that Jonah finally said, yes, I will obey, is not insignificant. I preached a sermon in December of 2017 entitled The God of the Second Chance. And if you feel in your life regard, in, with all the things that have gone on, with perhaps choices that you've made, I want to encourage you to go back 
and listen to that sermon because God indeed does give second chances. God calls 2.0. Number two, Jonah obeys. Jonah obeys. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against the, the message that I tell you. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Jonah said yes, and we all need to say yes to God. I don't know about your nose uh, when you say no to God. I always know in my heart that God is going to do what he wants to do. And I'm going to do ultimately what he wants me to do. It's my choice about how long it takes for me to come into alignment with God and how painful that process may ultimately be. Many of you, of course, are aware of what's called Frontline Ministries at McLean Bible Church. Many of you have had some exposure to that perhaps years ago. In 1994, Pastor Ken Baugh was asked by McLean Bible Church to come from California to Northern Virginia to start Frontline Ministries. And what Ken would tell you is that he did not want to come. He obeyed and he came. But there were, as he described it, heel marks all the way across the United States. From California to Northern Virginia. Because he did not want to come. And yet God used that. And many of you here today and the whole surrounding region were impacted significantly by the ministry of Frontline at some point in time. God did an amazing work. Even through a man who left heel marks across the nation, he so badly did not want to come. And as it is, God used Jonah, who did not want to go, but he finally obeyed. Verse three, now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey in breadth. Now, many over the course of generations have thought, three days to get across Nineveh? No, there's no such thing as an ancient city, like maybe today, but there's no such thing as a city in the ancient world that was so big that it took three days to get across until archaeologist Sir Austin Henry Laird chronicled the rediscovery of Nineveh and stated that the circumference of the greater Nineveh was exactly three days' journey as recorded in Jonah 3.3. He wrote that in 1854. Now, we don't rely on archaeology to affirm the Bible, but it sure is encouraging when archaeology does. So indeed, Nineveh was an enormous metropolis, likely to be close to a million people. Again, enormous by ancient standards. And Jonah finds his way into Nineveh. Number three. Not only does God call 2.0, not only does Jonah obey, but Jonah preaches, sort of. Verse four. Now Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now rarely in my study do I come across scholars who disagree so significantly on how to take a passage like this one. There are those who say, Jonah walked in and he preached. He had the courage. I mean, here are people who would just as soon fillet him as listen to him. That's how horrible they were. He was risking his life to go into Nineveh to preach these words. What courage! This is amazing! And there are other scholars who say this is the most pathetic sermon in the entire Bible. I mean, it's all of five words long in the Hebrew. He doesn't tell them why they're going to be overthrown. He doesn't tell them who is going to overthrow them. He doesn't tell them anything. He doesn't even mention God in all of this. It's as if he walked in to Nineveh, got a day's journey in, and he said, turn or burn. And then he walked out, and that was it. Now, there are things that we don't know about the literary realities of this book. We know that it is a dramatic and poetic book. 
We don't know if Jonah repeated his brief sermon many times throughout the city of Nineveh. But that's not really the point. The point is that Jonah went to Nineveh and he didn't want to. And even his worst efforts at a sermon produced fruit that only God could produce. That is the point of the sermon. God is able to take even our meager capacity when it comes to communicating his relentless love to people who need to hear it. And he is able to leverage it and use it in his plan for the greater good because here the people of Nineveh repented, which brings us to number four. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Whoa, what? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown? And you, you, you receive that and you turn. Sackcloth, of course, is an ancient symbol of extreme mourning and repentance. Putting on a burlap bag, essentially, publicly says, I am humbling myself. I'm making myself low. I'm grieving, I'm repenting. Now Jonah speaks to the people of Nineveh roughly 780 BC. Scholars tell us that there were a couple of critical things that occurred in that rough time frame that may, may be a reason, that may have what God used to prepare the hearts of the Ninevites to respond well. One, was that there was a, an extreme famine in the land. Now whether we know exactly that this was the exact time when Jonah was preaching, not for sure, but there was an extreme famine in the land. The other was a solar eclipse. And what we know about the ancient mind is that weather events and celestial events were enormously significant for them. But neither here nor there, if that's true, perhaps it is, perhaps what God used to soften their hearts so that when Jonah preached the message, as brief as it was, they responded. I want to talk for a moment about repentance. Remember last week, we made a distinction between three things. We talked about submission, obedience, and repentance. We said that Jonah submitted, he obeyed, but repentance, eh, not so much. Repentance, we said, was a change of heart and mind that abandons former dispositions and results in a new self to change one's way. It's a, it's a total person thing. It's a, it's a mind thing. It's a heart thing. It's I'm all in. I'm moving in this direction and I change my heart, my mind, all about me to go, I'm setting that aside and I'm now moving in a fresh direction. Here's the challenge. Is repentance is not... It's a distasteful word in our time. It's a distasteful word. It kind of carries with it a fire and brimstone sort of experience when we say that word. I mean, as believers, as followers of Jesus, we would say that those who don't know Jesus need to repent. But, but we're not comfortable actually saying that word to them. Oh, and when it comes to me as a believer, I don't really like it for me as well. I mean, I did repent and I'm willing to acknowledge that, but that was like back when I accepted Jesus, I repented. Repent simply means to change your direction. You see, I believe, as I said last week, that the church in America and perhaps us as individuals need to repent. We need to repent of the tact that we have taken when it comes to God's call to be his people who bring his relentless mercy to the world around us. The world has begun to marginalize us, begun to tell us that what we say doesn't matter, begun to say that we are actually dangerous, and all of those things cause us to want to take a step back I understand. I mean, when you kind of get a, a punch in the face, you, you kind of want to step back and go, whoa. I will think twice now, a second time, about whether or not I'm going to open my mouth here, there, or somewhere else about Jesus. 
I was reading a story not too long ago about Christians in Afghanistan. A small group of Christians who after the withdrawal of Western troops and the takeover of the Taliban and the ongoing deterioration of life under their regime, many have fled. But there are some who have stayed. And these Christians are quoted as saying, God has called us to be lights in this world, even if it costs us our lives. And as I was reading that story, it brought all kinds of mixed feelings about my lack of boldness at times. In the world in which we live, which is far less dangerous overall than the world in which they're living. And I'm thinking, oh Lord, what am I willing to endure? What am I willing to experience to respond to your call, Jesus, to just love people and to mention your name as it becomes increasingly unpopular? McLaren in his ex expositions of the Holy Scriptures in the book of Jonah regarding this concept says probably the very purpose of this book was to show Israel that the spite and yet dreaded heathen were more susceptible to the voice of God than they were. The point of the book of Jonah is that Jonah goes in, he preaches a pathetic sermon because he doesn't want to be there and God turns them around and they repent. And the message to Israel is, you've been listening to the call of God through prophets for generations to turn your direction and you have been refusing to hear. You remember what Jesus said when he talks in the New Testament about the the sign of Jonah. You're not getting any other sign other than Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And then what he said was that the people of Nineveh, their repentance brings judgment on you. Talking about the religious elites of the day. The story of Jonah in some measure the repentance of the Ninevites under these weird circumstances of a pathetic sermon by a prophet who didn't even want to be there brings a message to everyone who ever, has ever followed the one true living God that basically says, embrace God's call. God is calling us to bring his relentless mercy to the world around us. God calls 2.0. Jonah obeys. Jonah preaches, sort of. Nineveh repents. And then God relents. Verse 10. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. It is always a good thing when, God's de when God decides not to wipe somebody out. That's a good thing. And God is eager. God's judgment is coming. But God is always willing to go, Whew, all right, no judgment today. Not today. 2 Peter 3.9 says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. The ultimate unfolding of time will come. We will all stand before God. Everyone will give, to an, give an account. Those who have not obeyed, have not submitted to him, have not given their life to him, will end in judgment. But it says, but he is patient toward you, toward all of us. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. All should change their direction. And submit themselves to the living God. Five parts in today's message from this chapter. God calls, Jonah obeys, Jonah preaches, Nineveh repents, and God relents. Now I said at the beginning that the first two we've largely covered over the last couple of weeks. The last two, that's God's responsibility. But this third one, this third one is 
about opening our mouths, about you and me choosing to be willing when God provides the door to walk through it and speak the love of Jesus, the relentless mercy of God. Remember the whole call of the book is do our hearts reflect his compassion for the world? Do I look at every human being that comes across my radar screen with a compassion for, from God because they need him? Romans 10, verses 13 through 15, lays it out. It says this, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Every single one. But there's a challenge. How will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Now I know what many of us here today are thinking. Thinking, well, I'm not a preacher. I mean, dude, that's your job. You're, you're, and you're doing a great job up there, by the way. But, you know, that's you. I'm not a preacher. Well, in the original language, the, the word that's translated preach or preaching here is to simply proclaim. It's just, to, it's just to open my mouth. It's just to have words come out. It's just a declaration of a, of a truth. It's, it's simply saying, how will they hear unless there is someone who's willing to say the words? It has been said Preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. And I would tell you, that is fallacious. We should always preach the gospel with our lives, but unless we use words, it isn't the clear communication of the message of Jesus Christ. There are four pieces I believe in responding to the singular point today of Jonah preaching and the application to us. The first thing we need to do is evaluate our own hearts. The first thing we need to do is evaluate our own hearts. Where am I with regard to the notion of opening my mouth and expressing the love of God, the relentless mercy of God to others? Am I resistant? If I am, why might that be? If I am fearful, I understand that in today's world. I have to come to grips with what is standing in the way of me more effectively being able to communicate the truth of Jesus and his love for people to those around me. What's getting in the way? And I want to challenge you to take a few moments, maybe this afternoon, maybe in a quiet time tomorrow morning and say, Lord, all right, what is it? that makes it so challenging for me. You say, oh, I'm an introvert. Understand that. Understand that. I get all sweaty. My armpits get sweaty when I, when I think about saying something to somebody else about Jesus. I'm like, yep, mine too. Mine too. But that leads to the second step, which is to pray for an opportunity. Here's my challenge to you for this week. I want to encourage you every day this week that when you wake up every morning, before you launch out into your day, whatever your day holds, whether it's work or school or errands or carpool or whatever it is, God, would you provide an opportunity for me today to have a spiritual conversation with someone? I'm not talking about the four spiritual laws necessarily, or the bridge illustration on a napkin, or whatever it might be, just a spiritual conversation that might start out with, hey, I'm gonna pray for you today. Or a reference to God because of how amazingly beautiful the day is. Number three is to choose to speak. After I evaluate what my struggles are that gets in the way and I pray for an opportunity, then when God provides that opportunity, I gotta say something. And I understand the sweaty armpits, but you know what I've discovered? 
There is absolutely nothing more gratifying in the life of a follower of Jesus Christ than when we experience spiritual sensitivity in a given situation, we respond. We leave the results to God. I can't determine someone's response and that's not even the point necessarily. But that when I respond and I open my mouth and I something, say something Jesus related, and I bring a word of encouragement or prayer. I walk away going, thank you, Jesus. And then the next time that God provides that opportunity, my armpits are probably maybe just a little less sweaty. And a little less sweaty and a little less sweaty. And then before you know it, I find a sense of eager anticipation. And before you know it, I'm recognizing all kinds of opportunities that I never noticed before because I have been sensitized by the living God. This past week, I had an echocardiogram. Most of you know that I had open heart surgery in 2014 and every year I just go back and, you know, she jams that probe up to my ribs just to make sure everything's going all right. And I was laying there on the bed and she was doing her thing, you know, and I thought, okay, let me just see where this goes. And I said, you know, I am really so blessed because if it wasn't for technology that allowed the doctors to put an animal, a, a, a cow valve into my chest, I wouldn't be here today. I am so thankful to God for that. Nothing. Okay. Uh, I know multiple people in the practice that this woman works in who are followers of Jesus. And I said, I know so-and-so. They're so awesome. Oh, yep, I know so-and-so. They are so great. I just really, they're really awesome people. Nothing. I'm like, I am like swinging in a miss. It's like, whew, whew. You know, at a certain point in time, I could, kept, I could have kept pressing, but it was abundantly clear she was not interested in anything that was God-related. And I just had to determine at that point in time that God had not prepared the soil yet I cast out a few seeds. There was nothing that was happening. And I walked away saying, thank you, God, for prompting me to say the things that I did. And off we go. Also this past week, our shepherd group went out to dinner at, for a social. And as we were gathered, our food was about to come and my wife looked at our server and she said we're getting ready to pray for our meal is there anything I can pray for we can pray for you about well what came after that was something we did not expect she expressed what was going on and I won't mention the restaurant or her name or because she may even be watching today because we gave her our information and, and if you are it's we want to walk with you because Jesus loves you and we do too but she started to express what's going on in her life and she started to cry and my wife started to cry. And we had a moment because my wife, who is an introvert, was simply willing to say to a, a server, we're about to pray, can we pray for you? Who knows where God's gonna take that? But until we're willing to embrace the challenges that we're facing, Pray for an opportunity. Walk through the door and open our mouths when God provides the opportunity and then leave the results to him. We are not going to be in a place where over the course of time, God develops us and develops us and we become the people that God wants us to be in this world, in this time in history, in Northern Virginia for the sake of the gospel as things get harder and harder in our world for the gospel. And my question is, are you in? Are we in it together? God has chosen us to live right here, right now. None of this is a surprise to him. And it's my prayer that this week, each and every one of us, myself included, will evaluate the struggles that we're having that we will recognize and pray for opportunities, that when God provides them, we will choose to speak, leaving the results to him so that we can be his messengers with the relentless mercy of the living God 
for all people, even the un most unlikely people, like those awful, rotten Ninevites, to whom Jonah did not want to go, for whom he preached an awful sermon, and in whom God brought transformation and repentance. And God wants to do that right here, right now, through each and every one of us today. Who is it for you? Who has God providentially placed in your life that you might communicate the mercy of the living God? Will you do it? And if you're a person here today and you have never accepted Jesus as your savior, the one call, as we've been saying, the only call that God really wants you to respond to is a call into a relationship with him through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That when you receive him, your sin goes on him. His righteousness is imputed to you. You stand clean before God and you enter into an eternal relationship with the living God. God's one call for you today. Please respond. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace to us today. Thank you that you are so patient, that you love us so much, that you gave us your relentless mercy. And I pray, Lord God, that you would use each of us. God, that we would evaluate our hearts, we'd pray for opportunities every day, Lord. Help us to pray for an opportunity. Help us to open our mouths when you provide it. And God, thank you for the results, whatever it is that you do to use us for your honor and your glory. And Father, if there are those who don't know you today, I pray that they would receive the payment of Christ today. And Lord, for any that are struggling, I pray they'd go out to the starting point table in the lobby, talk to Brian and join that conversation so that they may understand more to be able to say yes to your call. We love you, Lord. We pray all these things in your great name. Amen.